Are you ready to unlock hidden savings within your organization's Microsoft 365 subscriptions? Introducing Tenant Detective, an application designed to analyze your Microsoft 365 usage data and uncover cost-saving opportunities without impacting your users. Picture this. Your organization invests in Microsoft 365 subscriptions, but are you truly maximizing its value? With Tenant Detective's proprietary set of algorithms, you can now gain unprecedented insights into your Microsoft 365 usage. Imagine receiving a detailed usage analytics report tailored specifically to your organization. Discover how much you can save by eliminating unused licenses and rationalizing subscriptions for over-licensed users. With Tenant Detective, you can rest assured knowing that your organization's Microsoft 365 investment is being put to its best use. Say goodbye to overspending on licenses that sit idle and hello to a more cost-efficient future. Visit tenantdetective.plow.net today to start optimizing your subscriptions. Hey Cut the Shit listeners, you can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Go check us out. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I'm very excited to have Scott Augenbaum as our guest. It's no exaggeration to call Scott a cybercrime expert, having spent 15 of his 30-year FBI career as a supervisory special agent and squad leader with cyber prevention and counterintelligence teams. After retiring, he has become a highly sought-after author and speaker, working tirelessly to promote cybersecurity awareness within the private sector. As you will hear in this discussion, Scott makes the point that despite the massive increase in cybersecurity spending, the problem has continued to get worse and worse, so he advocates for a very human solution to what is essentially a human problem. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Scott Augenbaum. Scott, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you today? I'm doing great. You see the big smile on my face? You look happy. I like that. That's because I've been retired from the FBI for seven years. Seven years. So uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that a little bit. So, um, but before we kind of dive into the meat of the discussion, I always like to start with a little kind of warm up. Um, get your brain, get your brain moving, especially now that you're a retired guy. So you're, you know, you're you're relaxing all the time. So we'll we'll make sure we'll make sure you're ready to go. Um, can you give us an example of, of an interesting, you know, technology, use of technology or a hack um, that you've seen lately? It could be, you know, in your personal life. It could be something you've seen in some of your work. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be related to security or anything like that. Just anything interesting technologically that you've seen lately. Uh, I don't look at it that way. I, I just almost look at it like I'm still blown away by the, you know, everyone's using hack, using tech to improve our lives and everything. But the thing that blows me away is how social engineering, which is you doing nothing more than using pressure to trick someone into doing something they normally wouldn't do, how rampant that is. And because of the fact that every 10 year old and every 75 year old has a cell phone, these people are getting ripped off and you know, everyone's looking for the little hack that's going to prevent this stuff from happening, but it's not, it's really kind of changing our mindset. So that's really the hack that I see. Gotcha. Gotcha. And that'll, that's a, that's a little foreshadowing, I think for, uh, for the conversation to come. So, all right, well, let's get right to it. Um, so to get it started, how about you give us a, just give us a thumbnail sketch on kind of your background, sort of how you got to from the early your early days. I know you're in the FBI. You already mentioned that. So kind of talk us through your time at the bureau, you know, and then get us up to where you are today uh, in terms of your in terms of your career. Sure. Um, if you would have told me some uh, almost 36, 37 years ago that I'd be retired from the FBI handling information security, wrote a book, living in Nashville, Tennessee, I would have said, no way, not my life. Grew up in New York City, graduated high school at 85. I thought I was, you know, 
went to community college to get my act together and uh, didn't do very well in community college, raised by a single mom who was just happy that I was making some progress in my path wow. towards mediocre mediocrity. But uh, you might find this funny, but she actually filled out an application for me to become a file clerk with the FBI in 1988, uh, making uh twelve dollar twelve thousand thirty eight dollars a year and that's where i started my journey brian in 1988 as a file clerk went back to college at night finished up a bachelor's in liberal arts started working on an mba in finance and technology and i was one of the early adapters in 92 to use aol used the lexus nexus terminal oh, at yeah. my college uh, I, I was amazed when I would go into the technology center, would take the train an hour just to get into the library, just to be able to use uh, the subscription service for LexisNexis yep. uh, and, and even Bloomberg terminals, which were great. I was, And that kind of gave me a little bit into the started technology and uh Went to Quantico in 1994 as uh, got selected to be an FBI agent. In order to get that selection, you need to have be between the ages of 24 and 37, four-year college degree, three years work-related experience, and uh, pass a polygraph exam. Have you ever been polygraphed, Brian? I have not. It seems daunting, though. I'll, that, that just seems like a weird experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horrible experience, and somehow I passed my first one, and I became an FBI agent. So the polygrapher must have had an off day that day, and uh, I went to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and I spent 16 weeks there and was all excited to go back to New York City as my first office of assignment, and I got selected to go to Syracuse, New York. Oh, nice. It's lovely there in the winter. Oh, yes. Snowiest, uh, one of the snowiest cities in the United States. And uh, but boy, but I have a blast. I mean, we were, there's 56 field offices in the FBI. And this was out of the Albany division. And we have these resident agencies, which are smaller sub offices. So we had a okay. nine man office and covered five counties all the way up to the Canadian border. And when I got there, I was like, what am I going to do? Like, stolen snowmobile cases but <laughs> you know i was dealing with bank robberies fugitives drug cases and um in 1998 the fbi became the lead law enforcement agency responsible for critical infrastructure protection not cyber crime and since i had advanced i, I would assume at that point was it like utilities was that was that was a thought around like the grid and oh, yeah, was yeah, that, yeah okay yeah 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 I'll get to that, but the okay. reason I got selected for that is because I had advanced computer skills in 1998. You want to take a guess? What do you think advanced computer skills were? You, you knew what the internet was? You, you had an AOL account and you you, you, you were in some chat rooms? I, I don't know. Like what, what it, it couldn't have been much. I mean, maybe you had you had a little Fortran. You took a Fortran class. Fortran. And- <laughs> I can't even spell. I was a whiz with Windows 95. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. Uh, or, yeah, I was going to say three, you know, Windows 3.1, you know, commands. You could do some basic commands. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I always joke and I go, hey, does anyone remember the days of DOS? And I go, don't raise your hand, because if you do, if you did something fun and productive, you didn't date very much in high school. <laughs> Windows 95 came, came along and it made everything easy. And I remember the first time that I ever dealt with it, I got a telephone call from a internet service provider in Oswego, New York, who called me up because somebody was selling stolen property on these things called bulletin boards. Right. And uh, one of the great things about being an FBI agent I learned from one of my mentors is crime doesn't happen in the office. You got to be out of the office. So I got in the car, drove out there, met this guy. He showed me this thing called the World Wide Web. It was one of those small internet service providers. And at that point, I, I got hooked. I don't remember what happened to the case, but I remember I went out and spent about two grand on a 133 megahertz gateway computer. 
And by default, I became the internet guy in the office. And now critical infra, the, the National Infrastructure Protection Center comes in. A lot of people say, how come the government's not doing anything? And I like to say it was almost 25, 26 years ago that the NIPSI was formed as the interagency task force to protect the 16 critical infrastructures of the U.S. And what do they all have in common? There's a lot of foreshadowing here. Critical infrastructure was owned by the private sector and not the government. And there needed to be a better relationship between the government and the private sector back in 1998. So that's where I cut my teeth in getting into the world of cybercrime. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. And so let's fast forward. Well, before we do that, how, let, let, let's, we, we have no choice, but you, you've, you've given us one story, but it, it wasn't that sexy. It was more of a, it was more of an explanation for how you got into technology. Before we get to sort of fast forward to retirement and kind of where you are today, how about you give us a couple of stories, give us a couple of good stories from your FBI days of uh, maybe successful operations or, you know, a couple of things that happened that were pretty interesting. I'm, I'm going to get into all of that. And, I, and I'm a storyteller. So everything is, you know, doing that. So when I get assigned to become the Internet guy in the office, all of my friends in the office kind of make fun of me because you would judge by the work that you do. I'm a six foot two guy. You know, I'm like, I want to work. I want to be the bank robbery guy. Right. You didn't look like a computer guy. They were thinking like they're thinking like a guy with a pocket protector, a little skinny guy, you know, one of those guys. Right. That's what they would be. Exactly. Thinking. We yeah. had two female agents in the office and one was on the DEA task force hunting down drug dealers. The other one was working with the marshals on fugitives. And I'll tell you one of my stories at the time that and this isn't a fun. This isn't a sexy story, but it, but it really kind of goes into what it was like. I mean, I get a call from the National Infrastructure Protection Center. It's 2000 or so, and it's a snowy Sunday in April in upstate New York. And they tell me that there is some kid try at Potsdam University trying to gain unauthorized access to the Cape Kennedy Space Center. And they give me one set of instructions. Go neutralize the threat. So what does that mean to you, Brian? That sounds like kill him. <laughs> yeah, we can't. So I kind of drive up there and, you know, play social services worker. And, you know, I was in a bad mood. And, you know, I, you know, I didn't join the FBI to kick down the door of some kid in feet pajamas. Yeah, kind of thinking war games. That's that's what, that's yeah, what comes that's to mind. That's really you know? what it was. Yeah. And, you know, I get back to the uh, I get back to the to the office. I call the National Infrastructure Protection Center, and uh, I tell them I neutralize the threat. This kid will never use a computer again. Trust me. And I get a call about two or three days later from the kid's mother, who's really concerned because her son didn't go out of the house for the past week. And I go, "What did I have to do with that?" And she goes, well, you told him there was going to be a black van following him everywhere he went. And I was like, all right, we'll call it off. There was no black van. But yeah. back then, Brian, we were chasing thrill seekers. We were chasing amateurs. But after September, of the events of September 11th, the FBI forms a cyber division at FBI headquarters to combat this emerging cyber threat because we're starting to see credit cards on the internet. And that is where things are going. Now, I go to FBI headquarters in 2003 to become one of the first supervisors building up the FBI Cyber Task Force program. And when I take this job, a lot of my peers again made fun of me. They said, you're committing career suicide because the cyber problem will go away by 2007 and it'll be solved by a lot of smart people with technology. Let me ask you, how's that working out for anyone today? Yeah, that hasn't really gone as uh, as maybe they thought. My assumption is the path to, to, to career growth was through the field, I, I would assume. Through the what? Through field offices. Is that, would that be the norm? Yeah. So I, yeah. So in order, my wife hated the weather in Syracuse. Imagine that. Shocking. There was yeah. only one place to go. I went to Washington, D.C. 
into the cyber division. And then I was getting groomed to take a field desk, which then I'm promoted in late 2006 to be the first cybercrime supervisor in Nashville, Tennessee, handling uh, a squad of uh, seven FBI agents, 10 task force officers. But I'm going to be honest, in 2007, about 85% of my work was online child exploitation. And we were seeing that. And then I would say probably in about 2008, that's when it all changed. And nobody really wanted to take this stuff seriously. And, and through my eyes, what's happening in 2008? We're starting to see transnational criminal enterprises are really starting to step up their game. That's when there was something called the Russian Business Network, which was a bulletproof Internet service provider in St. Petersburg, Russia, that was responsible for a lot of the malicious code being distributed, a lot of the child pornography. The Chinese started stepping up their game, and that's when we see a lot of big breaches that are going in. Uh, we we're seeing Google is being targeted by the Chinese government. I start seeing in Nashville, Tennessee, in about 2008, 2009, the Chinese government starts to get into healthcare to steal their bandwidth. So now things are starting to change a little bit. Right. But my frustration is nobody's taking it seriously. I'm going to be speaking at the ISSA conference uh, this year. Because I spoke at it 18 years ago, and I'm going to compare and contrast what was going on in 2006 to what is going on today and being able to tell everyone that it doesn't surprise me that we're in the situation that we're in today. And we'll go through that. You know, uh, I have a whole path to lay out there. But that's really the transition for me getting to Nashville, where I start managing this at first sleepy little squad. And I spend the majority of my career being the town crier, telling people that there's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. big problems coming. Right, right, right. And so, okay, so fast forward. Um, you got to, you got to Nashville in 08, is that correct? Uh, 06. 06. So you and I retired and I retired in 2018. Let okay. me just jump ahead to for that for one second. When yeah. I retire in 2018, I don't think the problem can get any worse. I'm like we're in ground zero. This is it. The nuclear bomb went off. Right, right. And back then cybercrime was only maybe a 1.5 trillion dollar global problem. And today it's an 8 trillion dollar problem. I said this, I go it's it can't get any worse than it is. And I feel like I've been saying that my whole career. I mean, for decades I've been saying well, we're going to get our shit together. I mean, I can't say that because that's the name of yeah, it. Yeah, you can say that here. Yeah, it's a safe space. Safe space, Scott. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so talk to us a little bit. So you get, you get, you get to 2018. You put in your time. That's 30 years, I think, right? So um, 29.6. I wasn't even waiting for an extra six months. All right. And, but let me tell you what I learned, and I want to go through this with you. Uh, I coined the phrase, the four truths about cybersecurity. I was going to ask you about that. So, so lay that out for us. And then I want to hear how you, how, where did the, where, what was the genesis for that? Okay. So, you know, have you ever heard the term FUD? Yes. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Well, I had someone came to me and they said, you know, your presentation's filled with too much FUD. And I said, it's not FUD. It's fear from real experience, FFRE. I got to come up with something to make that sound like a word or something. But during my decades with the FBI, I touched a thousand victims. People say to me, what's the most horrible thing you've ever seen in your life with the FBI? And I go, I still see it to this day. It's the fact, and this is how the four truths is. So every single one of my victimizations came by the same thing. And I want to, I want to hear your comments on it. Number one, every victim went like this. Can't believe this happened to me. Why would anybody want to target me? I'm only a blank. 
I'm a small business. Well, you know, Nashville is the Silicon Valley for healthcare. Sure. I had a healthcare company tell me one time they weren't too concerned of being victimized because they were a small company. What's your definition revenue wise of a small company? Yeah, well, that we know those we know those very widely, right? For me, that's a small company is probably less than five or ten million in revenue, right? This company, what were they? A hundred million, two hundred million, three hundred million. Yeah, yeah. So they they were thinking compared to HCA, they're a small company, yeah. right? I mean, sure. So is almost everybody. <laughs> everybody, and they're like, well, we don't have anything, and especially kind of when I would deal with small businesses and nonprofit organizations and parents whose kids got hurt or senior citizens. Just the other day, I dealt with this individual who ended up losing five point eight million dollars in a pig butchering scam. Are you familiar with pig butchering? No, I don't. Well, write I that mean, note down to ask me about it. It's, it's not. It, you know, because that's probably one of the number one cyber crimes that I'm dealing with now. And they're like, I can't believe I was targeted. Why would anyone target me? I don't have anything that anyone wants. I once had a company come. So here's what would happen. So part of my job with the FBI was to get out and talk to these companies and explain to them that they could be potentially a victim. All so right. I once had a company come to me and they said, we're not concerned because we only have $5.8 billion in revenue. And according to, I guess it was, you know, some big uh, data breach report, the cyber criminals were only targeting companies over $10 billion. I once had a privately held $10 billion company tell me they weren't concerned because they weren't public. Yeah. yeah. And this is my empathy nerve. I tug on this and I wanted to say, where are you getting your information from? People magazine, the cyber criminals do not care who you are. They want access to your stuff. And they they all fit through that. They all were, they all were blown away. So that's one. Couldn't happen to me. What's two? Two is, so I want you to imagine for a second that you are the victim of a cybercrime incident. And if it's, if you're a healthcare company, they stole your PHI. If you're a retail establishment, maybe you got hit with ransomware. If they're a small, if you're a small business, they got access to your payroll file. If you are a parent, your kid became the victim of sextortion. If you're just a regular person, you realize that your all your information is on the dark web. When you when when you become a victim and you are victimized, law enfor- and you contact law enforcement. Law enforcement does not have a magic wand to fix the problem. Right. There's no reset button or anything like that. And so often, when I would come over and I would sit with victims. And I would be able to explain to them just like I did the other day in another situation where I have this woman who lost her life savings of $47,000. And and just to be able to sit there with the victim and say, I wish I could help you. And there are ways if you can catch it that you can claw your money back on the business email compromised. And there's a whole cryptocurrency working group designed on the pig butchering scam. But I hate to say it once you're once you're a victim, like that's my whole goal for people is I and when I say this in all of my presentations, I have one goal here today, not to meet you as a victim. So that's truth number two. All right. Number three. Number three is, as we in the private sector keep spending more and more money on the problem, I'm going to tell you that I always would say in law enforcement, we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. Well, we need to build better laws. There's new legislations. There's a new cyber policy. And then I go like this. The bad guys are in Russia, China. Iran, North Korea, and they're in a lot of different lawless parts of the world yeah. where we can't get it, where we can't put the bad guys in jail. Even though the FBI and Secret Service still do a great job in arresting bad guys, it's almost like any time I would see like the Coast Guard would intercept, 
you know, 100 kilos of coke. And, you know, in law enforcement, you want to celebrate when you do that. But at the yeah. end of the day, you're not solving any problems. No. No, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a symptom. It's not the root cause, right, that, well, that you're dealing that with. Almost every single yeah. thing that I deal with today, it kind of breaks my heart. But because, you know, I dealt with a CPA the other day, they got into his email system, they were able to intercept an email, they were able to trick him into sending money to the wrong account. The bank even asked him, are you sure you want to do this? So the bank has no liability whatsoever. His, by the time, you know, you bring in law enforcement, it's gone. It's weeks later, we're not putting the bad guys in jail. Yeah. And I dealt with this time and time again, even to this day, whenever I speak with a victim, because they all find me, you know, somebody said to me, they go, Scott, how are you going to stay relevant when you retire from the FBI? And all the victims, all, everybody finds me, I'm on LinkedIn. And, and I hate to say it, Ms. Brian, when you call me, I'm a hospice. Right. Right. It's too late. Yeah. I'm an old person. And then I had this epiphany and it was probably about 2016. I was out. I was talking to a victim, this individual and something that still plays out eight years later, went to Google, looked for an investment advisor, specializing in a certain investment, clicked on the first link, which was the sponsored link from Google, because if it's a sponsored link from Google, it has to be legitimate, right? Sure. No. And then he got tricked out of $700,000. And we opened up a case. We followed the money. We lost the money. It went from Tennessee to California to New York to Georgia, but unfortunately went to the country of Georgia. And I'm sitting there with the family and the family's looking at me going, you know, what if this was your father, you know, and I was getting abused meant verbally and emotionally. And I, I'm going to be honest, I got depressed because that was every day. And I just wanted to put my arm around the victim and say, well, if you just would have done these four or five things, you would have prevented victimization. And that's when I learned the fourth truth to cybersecurity. And that is a majority of the cybercrime victimizations could have been prevented if my end users were only armed with a few key pieces of information. And I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I've identified patterns of victimization. And I'm going to, I'm going to, and I wrote a book called The Secret to Cybersecurity. And you know what the secret is? There is no secret. It's, it's common sense. It's hygiene. It's being aware of this. But common sense is not common practice. So when I retire in 2018, I start, you know, going out and starting to speak to companies and writing books and building training programs for companies just with one goal to share my level of knowledge. And so let's talk about the end user, because I do think you know, I mean, I work in IT. IT does some great things, but we're overly focused on the technology itself instead of the, you know, the problems that we're trying to solve with technology, right? We, we, li we love to say at, at Plow, you know, technology is just a tool, right? It's a, it's a, it's a form of a hammer. A hammers, hammers are good for certain things. They're not for good for other things. And you always need to keep in mind that it's just a hammer, right? It's not a magic, it's not a magic wand to use a, you know, to, to reference something you said earlier. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've fallen, uh, well, maybe not falling into the trap. A more cynical person would say we followed the money to more and more complicated, more and more expensive technology solutions to try to solve a problem that we're really not actually solving the problem because the problem is at the end user level, right? As, as I, I mean, I remember when I was a CIO, um, the first time we had a breach, uh, I remember my CEO asking me, well, what's the likelihood of this happening again? And I said, it's a hundred percent. And he said, he said, what do you mean? I said, we're going to get, there's going to be a breach again. I don't know when, I don't know where, 
and we'll do our best to, to minimize that. I was like, but it's going to happen. I said, if you don't want to breach, we've got to get rid of all the cell phones and get off the internet. I said, and then we got a chance. And he's like, well, we can't do that. We have no business. And I said, that's why I said it was hundred <laughs> percent. And I still stand by that statement that I think, I mean, that's what, if you think about the concept of zero trust is that in a nutshell, right? The, 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 the primary assumption is don't trust anybody and assume breach, right? Those are the sort of the two founding principles of zero trust architecture, because as you know, right? I mean, they're, 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 you can prevent a lot of these things um, <clears throat> with better end user behavior, right? Because the, the more and more, high tech we get, it seems to be that the more and more this, to your point, you talked about social engineering first, you know, as your, as your hack uh, or as, as, as the technology trend that you wanted to highlight. And to me, it just becomes more and more important that no matter, no matter what we do, the, the devices we have that we, that we cannot live without now phones and mobile computing have made us made it that much easier to be accessed by social engineering. So I'm just, I'm curious to know, so you've talked about the difference, but you, you, you want to give the speech from 06 to 24. What's, is, is it the, is it the prevalence of cell phones and sort of email and text capability? Is that been the biggest, do you think the biggest driver in terms of the continued sort of unabated um, expansion of, of, of cyber issues uh, despite the prevalent, you know, despite the, development of initial technologies to sort of quote unquote deal with the issue? I don't think the technology is focusing on the issue. We're looking for a technology solution to solve a people problem. And when we get to that point, we won't be thinking anymore. Right. Okay. It's just that simple. It's the level of sophistication. People don't realize the lack of sophistication that is required to pull one of these major cyber breaches off. Now, um, the big companies have lots of problems, have lots of money to throw at these issues, but they still face their challenges. They still don't have the buy-in from upper management because, you know, in today's day and age, you know, uh, C- a C-suite's only staying at a company 18, to two, 18 months to two years. I mean... I have seen some companies here in Nashville that people think are highly rated. And I'm like, if you just would realize how the CIOs ran some of these companies into the ground because of their lack of understanding of the threat and their lack of throwing money at shiny objects because this guy bought the product. And, you know, and and my whole, and I'm going to be honest with you, I pretty much give it up on trying to, help corporations. I mean, listen, I get in, I get brought in to change behavior and stuff like that. I help people. You know, I focus on people, you know, when large companies, I mean, I've sat here in the news and when I've seen some pretty big breaches, I mean, I don't want to name names like change healthcare. uh, I just happen to go, wow, I can't believe it took so long for something like that to happen. Right. You know, or I see some of these other large organizations that I tried to work with in the past that it all came back. And my information security, and I don't blame my information security people, they know how to lock it down. But it always comes up to the fact that, listen, we don't want to spend money on technology that's going to make it more inconvenient for the end user. Right, right. That's really what it, it's, it's not. It's not spending per se. It's the, either the, I mean, some of it is real. There's no question that some, some prevention mechanisms for end users Whoa, do I'm slow you down. I'm not saying we don't need this. I, yeah. you, listen, but, uh, but, but, you know, everybody's looking for like, you know, to be able to do like the advanced Taekwondo spinning triple back kick when they don't know how to block. Right. Right. You know, and we've been, and uh, and I've been hearing this and, and one of the things that people would say to me all the time, and this always pisses my auditor friends off, you know what it means to me when you tell me you're PCI or you're HIPAA or high trust compliant. Same as a lot of other my victims, compliance is not the same thing as security. Right, right. I mean, I've been seeing this so much with the banks over over the years. And 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 that's why I came up with the concept of the cyber secure mindset. And it really kind of was like a real, real sarcastic jab at the information security marketplace. Because here's the way I, you know, 
Here's the way I look at it. If the problem keeps getting worse and worse, and we keep spending more and more money on the problem, and the problem keeps getting worse, what does that mean? What are we doing? Yeah, we're failing, right? I mean, for, for failing miserably. But what if I told you that 90% of what I dealt with could have been prevented if my end users were only armed with a couple of key pieces of information? And and let me just walk through the magic of, and I, and I just want to, I can do it in 90 seconds. Go on for it. The elements. And then, and, and then I can, we can do a deeper dive. This is what people didn't realize. These are the patterns that I explored. And tell me how MDR, XDR, or EDR is going to solve any of this stuff. 90% of my stuff came down to the fact that my organizations didn't realize that social engineering was the number one threat, was the number one tool in the cyber criminals tool belt. But Scott, we have no before. And I go, are they covering the nine different types of social engineering that people can get hit with? And that, and that's a trick question because everyone's like, Shit. and I'll go through the nine after, but they didn't realize that social engineering is the number one tool in the cyber criminals tool belt. The account and all the cyber criminals want to do is steal a user name and password. Because in the old days, we had to worry about vulnerabilities in the server and everything. But today, everything's stored in the cloud. And it's stored in cloud platforms that the business associates, do, the businesses have no idea exist. They're stored in marketing platforms. They're stored in HR platforms. They're stored in sales platforms. They're all over the place and all it takes. So now... The, it, and all the bad guys need to do is steal a username and password. But 66% of the population is using the same password for multiple platforms. And with the last release of the Rock U 2024 data breach, that meant that there were 10 billion usernames and password combinations on the dark web with 66% of the population using the same password from multiple platforms, somebody's going to get into an organization's Salesforce, email, website, you know, or the 37 different types of healthcare platforms that are available. And if you're not using two-factor authentication on every one of those bits and pieces, bad guys going to get through. So if you don't know what you have, in the old day, of, I used to tell people, I haven't really talked about the core critical controls in years because nobody's up for having that conversation. You know, I used to say, well, if you don't know what's on your network, how can you patch what's on your network? True or false? I mean, it's, there's no argument, right? Yeah. But now if you don't realize as the, if you don't realize that your salespeople have 13 different cloud-based platforms that are storing customer information and you don't even know if they have two-factor authentication. Because let me ask you, from your experience, do salespeople like to put two-factor authentication? Of course on? not. Right. No one wants to de- no one wants to do that stuff, right? They 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 hate it, right? They actively they will actively undermine it if they can. Yeah. Okay. Those five elements that I told you make up 90% of my stuff. We haven't even touched ransomware. We're not even, we're not even talking about that yet. We're not even at that point. Right. So explain to me from what I told you, how do, how do these technology solutions, what's the one solution that anyone can buy that will eliminate? Uh, yeah. I mean, you, in your top 10, in your 10, it's, it's, it's MFA. That's the only, that's the only technology solution that's, that you, that you emphasize. Hey, you know what MFA is not going to do? It's not going to stop your clients who get account compromises from sending your people business email compromise messages. Well, you didn't say it was a panacea, but I mean, I was I was surprised when I first read the list. I was like, well, of the 10, there's really only one thing to buy in here. And he's not he's not you're not saying it's this it's the end all be all. You're saying it's the only technology solution, at least at a minimum that you're saying really makes any sense. Uh, you, you, you get what it does, you know? Yeah. But you, but remember you have to identify it and you can't, and, and in an enterprise organization, it'll take you years to figure this out, but every small business should have it. 
you yes. know, and that's what I really think about. And that's what I try to focus on is the technologies available. So if we're talking about the end users, knowing that stuff, and then there's a couple of other things that I think are absolutely no brainers that you should really be doing. You should be freezing your credit. You should should be using an antivirus product. You should be using a VPN if you are out and about and you like to use the Wi-Fi at Panera or a hotel. You should have a password manager. And you also should block on your iPhone anyone who's not on your uh, caller ID. You know, I it, and to me, what do I want to do? get into the C-suite, talk to these people. If I can get people to understand these very, very basic concepts, then I can help change the culture of an organization. Let's talk a little bit about that in terms of training, because you, you, you've, you've referenced training some. And, you know, that's been, I think, probably the greatest, I think the, probably the greatest failure um, from a from a cybersecurity perspective from my, from my from my viewpoint is, Training has either been poor, non-existent, or when it you know well well intentioned but unsuc you know not it hasn't worked. Um, and if you, I think if you look at training as a percent of spend, it's very small. So the first thing you can say was that's probably part of the issue, right? Is that you know what, what, where where do bank robbers go? They go what, you know what was the old saying about why did somebody rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Uh, and I'm not sure that that being you know. There's maybe a reason why we don't have world class training organizations, you know, com comparable to the MDR XDR organizations because there's not as much money there. Um, but I'm curious to get your perspective on it as someone in that space. What are you seeing? Is anything that gives you hope relative to the training side of the equation? I, I, I listen. I, you know, to me, it's a. I make a great living. I don't advertise. People call me. They're like, "Hey, can you come to my organization?" And I'm like, okay, what's next? You know, because companies will call me up. They'll say, hey, can you come speak at my event? And I'll go, yeah, sure. They go, well, how much time would be good? I go 90 minutes plus time for questions and answers. And they're like, huh? And they're, I guess, you know, when I get hired, it's like, check the box. Look, we're saying right. that we brought a person in and, you know, Scott, you're good. And, hey, we'll do this. And, you know, and then I started building virtual trading and customized virtual training. But one of the things that I find is people want an easy button, you know? Yeah. So to me now, you know what I do? I give all my content, just about all my content away, you know, because I get paid a lot of money from large organizations and my goal is to help small businesses. So what do I do? I try to post every, sometimes I can do it five days a week. I'm trying to post these nano videos, just very, very quick 60 second videos that you can watch on LinkedIn to talk about, you know, are you familiar with pig butchering? You know, yeah, like, I was going to say, and we got to get to that because you, you've, you've mentioned that a couple of times and I got to tell you, that's maybe the greatest teaser of all time. Um, because if, if everybody, if anybody listening doesn't want to know what pig butchering is at this point, then they're not paying not attention. So. Oh, hog I, I sort of assumed it didn't have anything to do with real pigs, but uh, um, why, don't, why don't you tell us about that? And then we can maybe close. We'll, we'll circle back to sort of uh, kind of wrap up with, uh, with some, with some forward looking stuff. We'll leave some Easter eggs for anyone who stays around late in here. I'm yeah. going to give away a couple of copies. I give away a couple of copies of my book. So we'll Perfect. leave in a couple of teasers mm -hmm. for this, but mm -hmm. It, it's just another form of social engineering, and it is a cryptocurrency scam where you are being reached out on LinkedIn or any other type of social media or even in dating. Red flag, if you meet somebody and they tell you about cryptocurrency trading, run, okay? Run, you know, so, and, and the reason they call it pig butchering, and, I, and I'll explain what they do, and then I'll ask you why do they call it pig butchering. Okay. So, you meet someone online, and uh, a lot of times it's a very, and this is being run out of uh, East, uh, it's running out of, by Chinese organized crime, and it's a human trafficking thing where they have these people who are pretending to be 
uh, very, very beautiful Asian and Eastern European models. They'll reach okay. out to you. They'll hit you up. And then they'll just start a very platonic relationship with you. And the first clue that they say is, let's talk on WhatsApp or Telegraph. If anyone wants to talk to you on WhatsApp or Telegraph, that means they're outside of the U.S. and they cannot text you. Yep. So they move you there and then you just have a conversation for three or four days. I spoke to one of these people and it, I was amazed on how well they did with psychology to build a relationship and a rapport. And the first thing the woman says to me is, and she becomes my friend, she checks in. But remember, at the end of the day, we all want human connection. Sure. And she says, all she goes I said, I don't understand this stuff. She goes, go to the app store and download this app. It's a simulated trading app. I'm like, right? If, if it's on the app store, it has to be real. So we go over there and uh, I didn't download the app, but I've seen from victims. So they give you $10,000 of funny money and nice. you they show you a couple of these trades and they take that $10,000 and they turn it into 87,000. And then they take that 87,000 and they turn it into 400,000. And then she says, isn't this great? So you invest $500 and she goes, do you want to try it like for a hundred bucks? So you do like a hundred bucks into it. And then all of a sudden, and so that like you'll wire them the money or you'll put it into a crypto account and then you'll do the same thing, but you're being tricked because there is no trade. So your $100 turns into a thousand. So now you put in a thousand dollars and that turns into 7,000 and the seven, and then you keep doing it. And that's where yada, 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 at the end of the day, I had a victim out $5.8 million of his own money because he thought that he had a half a billion dollars. And the way I found out is one of his friends called me because they said, hey, a buddy of mine is in a pinch. He wants me to lend him 250000 What do you think? So why do you, so from what I told you, if I did a good job telling you the story, why, why do they call it pig butchering? Well, they fattened you up before the kill. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's not very nice for the victims, but unfortunately this is happening all the time. Yeah, that's, it makes sense now once you explain the story. If I could sit down with my victims that I met before, that's why I'm so big on the education piece. You know, in, in many ways, it's funny because what you just described, like there's really, I mean, there's a there's a technology facilitator, the idea of cryptocurrency, right? But everything else, that's just I mean, if you think about it, it's an old school Ponzi scheme, right? Without having to without having to actually give money to anybody. It's even better than a Ponzi scheme because you don't actually have to give you don't actually have to give because you know, people the early the early investors in Ponzi schemes actually did make money, right? People don't I don't think people realize that. Like the first people in do get paid, right? They, 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 they get their money. I mean, it's other people's <laughs> investments, but they get returns from it, you know? But, but let me just quickly explain, uh, you, you know, so for me, when we talk about social engineering, we're talking about emails. We're talking about text messages. Yep. We're talking about telephone calls. We're even talking about QR code phishing, which is called quishing. We are also talking about social media hijacking, right. you know, like you get something gets taken over. We're talking about pop ups where you get your browsers out of date. You have a pop up. We're talking about malvertising when you go to a website. And if you type in right now, cell phone repair. Nashville, I guarantee you the first site you'll get to is a cyber criminal who will trick you. At the same time, we're also, we didn't even touch on the business email compromise. And now we are talking about pig butchering. So I have nine different social engineering types. And I'm sure if we sit here, we can probably come up with a couple of more. Yeah. yeah. But those are the things that's having a cyber secure mindset is being aware of this stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, just to, so when we think about, I mean, this is not exactly 
uh, been a sunny conversation, right? When we look to the future. Um, so if we think ahead, you know, next two, three years, what gives you hope? I mean, we've already, you've already made it clear, you know, sort of the, you, you know, we we want we don't want the we don't want the triumph of hope over experience and your experience tells you um we're not going in a good direction given the the past two decades right in terms of what we've seen in terms of progression but is there anything happening that gives you hope uh around a, an ability to sort of turn the ship a bit or at least stem the tide um uh, i mean i'm doing my part there are people that are doing theirs but at the end of the day it's you can only help those people who want to swim towards you. I did a presentation for a group of doctor's offices. I built them customized content. I had, I did 90 minutes worth of training. I built them a customized live training program. And I was going to pitch them into virtual with the whole cyber secure mindset. But I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give everyone here a copy of my book. So even if you don't care about your practice, you can keep your kids safe. You can keep your senior parents safe. This is everything you need. Just go buy an antivirus product and or identity theft solution that has one. You'll be safe. And out of 90 people, how many of them do you think took me up on it? I don't know. 10%, 20%. Three people. So I didn't even, you know what, what am I going to do? Right. Start, start sending them emails, pitching them what I do. No, not going to do it. You know, right. I, I just listen. It, it, it takes me down. It gives me a sense of hopelessness. But when I can connect with someone who says, thank you, Scott, because of you, I sat with my kids. I explained the dangers or someone will say, Scott, I haven't seen your video. I'm in a different phase in my career. You know, I make a great living as a speaker. I got a great pension. Uh, when I do this life, it's because I can't get fired from a job because I don't have one. Right. I mean, I, I, my new goal and one of the projects that I'm working on now, just to tell you, if anyone has any interest, and nobody does these projects because nobody has figured out how to make money. I'm, I built out a three-hour training program broken up into smaller videos to keep our senior parents safe, where I'm covering about 50 different types of scams and breaking those into bite-sized videos. And I think maybe if I can get my act together, I'll turn that into another book. And the other one is how to be a better digital parent. You know, those are the things. Listen, I can only do what I want to do. You know, when yeah. I've had the time with the big companies, I'm like, all right, hey, I'll put you in touch with my manager and we'll give you an overpriced speaking deal. And, you know, and in every one of these deals, I always offer them two hours and a free webinar six months later. And nobody ever takes me up on it. So I keep forgetting my time in the government. I was a government guy. I forgot the private sector is you're supposed to do as much work for the least amount. No, the least amount to work for the most money. Right, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're violating that principle, but uh, maybe not actually, as it turns out, you're, <laughs> you're offering the promise, but you're not actually having to follow up. Right. So. All right. So Scott, I always like to wrap up um, with something personal. It's not that personal, but it's a little bit personal. Um, so I'd like to ask you, can you share something you've read or, or watched lately that you think others ought to check out? And it doesn't have to be related to the topic. It can be, but it's not required. I've been trying to process the book Atomic Habits for the past three years. And I am rereading that over and over and over again, because in life, what do we want to do? If we can focus on being 1% better every day, that's all that's really important. And for me, you know, I'm in this weird time in my life where, you know, my youngest son is going to UT Knoxville. Okay. And, you know, it's been such a great retirement for me, because he had Crohn's when I retired, so I was able to spend six and a half years, and he's doing perfect, so we go to the gym together, and, you know, to me, I feel very blessed in what I do. I mean, I love what I do. 
I can't believe I get paid to do what I do. And, you know, like I'm building these prod projects. If I can keep a million families safe, I'm sure I'll never have to worry about money again. If I try to figure out how am I going to make a million dollars keeping families safe, then I kind of fail. So that's just what I do. I gotcha. Well, Scott, listen, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. For more information on you, um, we'll list your your website and some of the ways to find you on LinkedIn and the show notes. But is anything particular a couple of a couple of recommendations for 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 listeners to go check out in terms of resources that you think would be a good place for them to start? Start with my website, cybersecuremindset.com. And leave me a note. If you made it this far, I'll send you the audio copy and PDF copy of my book, The Secret to Cybersecurity. And if you're looking for any good recommendations for folks or who are good, let me know. Or if you have any questions, I okay. love to answer questions. I, I'm a public speaker. I get paid by the, by the breath. Gotcha. Gotcha. Excellent. All right, Scott. Well, listen, have a great day. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of it. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. This was great. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on TikTok, at Cut the Shit Pod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel, at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.